Welcome to technology. The point is, is that we that uh, CTL is is really interested in recording um, a series of of uh, conversations and presentations, so that the entire community can be involved. So, thank you to Sharif for for uh, making this possible, and thank you to to Lily, who seems to have run off again, um, for really making this possible. She's the one who gets all the information out and does a great job. You know, we're a community of, of learners and teachers. We're a whole community of scholars. But we're also individual people. And we have our own individual perspectives, backgrounds, cultures to bring in. In some senses, if we were outside the university, we wouldn't like each other very much. Um, in other senses, if we were outside the university, we might all gather together in a particular way um, to treat ourselves as the in-group and other people as the out-group. But once we're in the boundaries of the University of Alberta, we're all a community. And it's our job to work as a community. We all have individual stresses. And um, so Tony has set up this fabulous panel of talking about scholars at risk. And I'm not going to do much introduction to him. I'm going to try not to talk too much. But the way this is going to set up is that each one of these scholars is going to talk about their own particular area. They get about five minutes to set up the context, talk about themselves, their research, their interests. But more importantly, 10 minutes of, of tips for how we deal with scholars at risk, how we work together as a community of teachers and learners. So this is meant to be a session where we can all learn together and all contribute. Then, and I'll, I'll keep, hold them to their 15 minutes. I really can do that. And then we have a chance for the audience to ask a question or two. Then we'll go to the next one, and when we're done with all three, open it up to a big, uh, open it up to a bigger discussion. Okay, so I hope that works for everyone. It's, it's working for us, and I think it works really well for the topic. Our first speaker is Jerry Kutcher. He's from Ed Policy Studies, and he's going to talk about some financial issues. I'm so old that I came when we got office supplies <laughs> and photocopying, and we got any resources we needed for teaching and learning. What do we do now um, when we have a different culture of finances? And we also taught smaller classes. In my first five years of teaching, my class went from 25 students to 75. I had no different supports. I had nothing different. Um, what is the whole area of fiscal responsibility and the whole new economies and the culture of money have to do with teaching and learning in our wonderful University of Alberta? So, Jerry. Uh, welcome everyone on Friday afternoon, uh, when you could be going for a long, long weekend, I guess. Um, I'm uh, in educational policy studies and I have been teaching uh, formally uh, since 1980, uh, about 10 years as a public school teacher, as adult educator and a whole range of other jobs trying to find a full-time job. And then I started teaching university classes in 1988 and I've been teaching them ever since. I've been a full-time professor in uh, educational policy studies since 1996 and I was the first hiring of a new department which was an amalgamation. So I've experienced many changes. The uh, talk I'm going to talk about is uh, basically, uh, I would call it uh, sweet, sexy, dirty money. And I'm going to be talking about making money in the traditional sense, but I'm going to talk about making money in new ways. Uh, and it's about the accountability culture. Uh, the uh, audit culture, uh, or what I call the culture of money, and start thinking about money a little bit differently. Anyway, when I got back from my first sabbatical after 10 years uh, teaching at the university in the fall of 2006, I was about three weeks into teaching a grad course and photocopying handouts uh, uh, before, the end of, before class as usual when the photocopier stopped printing. I had handouts for the class prepared and I was really st struck by the fact that the machine stopped at 1,000 sheets for the term. This was completely new to me before it was unlimited and definitely uh, this had a pedagogical effect uh, more than on that one day. Um, I went to our APO as she was called then, their finance, uh, now named assistant chairs, to ask for an explanation. She told me of course all about cost savings, the new technology of the machinery, how it could be set up to monitor the photocopying and that in a sense in my own thinking I had been disciplined by an authority in an admin office for the first time as a professor. Um, 
how much do you need to complete the term, she asked me. And I joked, how much does the dean get? Assuming, I think, that there was a differentiated power effect where the dean's photocopying budget was not limited as mine had been at that time. In the end, I got another thousand copies and I had to change my strategy for getting the information to the students for the class discussions. But it just so happened that E-class, or whatever it was called then, was also available for me and I moved to such handouts onto the new technology and downloaded existing expenditures to the students. And by the way, my first online innovation that actually made my job easier was the class-based email on bear tracks when they came. Because that was the first time I thought, oh, this change actually makes my job easier. All the other ones made my job harder. So what I did in talking about this incident, it captures for me the conjunction of indirect and anonymous direction through money, law, language, and technology. The traditional way of thinking about money and institutional education or knowledge production or schooling is that money is one resource or conditionality that funds the provision for the process of products and practices and related competing educational purposes. Uh, what we might call, or Tony has called, the conditions of the work of faculty that make for the conditions of the student that you're teaching. And the purposes by which you teach, engaging for enlightenment, transmission of culture, social reform, vocational technical, human capital, scientific development, existential survival, many different purposes that I, that I have for me to teach. So while the above aspects of my photocopy experience can be multiplied and need explication, of late it focuses on one issue, so that we think about funding related to this kind of basis that we have. And what is missed here in looking at funding in this way is that money is not only used to fund education now, it is also used to control behaviors by incentivizing and disincentivizing particular goal-oriented activities of teachers and learners, or in the vocabulary, choosers and consumers, through the reorganization of their learning environments. So two basic theories that do that are complexity theory as well as behavioral economics. The increasing division of labor of knowledge production and requires distinguishing the ownership of knowledge production from its conception as a design architecture of choice for the choosers, the purchasers, the particular commodities, say the educational services for gaining a kind of money such as university credits, diplomas, certificates in the credential market. You have to keep separate the power of ownership from the conception, execution and the choices. In looking at the conception of knowledge production and the new architectural designs of choice, there are four key components with intersecting dynamics. The rise of the new form of political governance via activists, administrators. Two, a revivified therapeutic pedagogy of love, emphasizing institutional loyalty and happiness, that is compliance without complaint. Modernizing from above and promoting mandatory enthusiasm for new information technologies. And for what I want to focus on here, financialization, the culture of money and the increased exploitation of academic labor via rent-seeking elites and the imperative to maximize capital gains and the inequalities that they produce in wealth from financial profits, interests, and rents. So I want to turn our attention to that side of the equation. So I'll go to my scene two. Imagine something different than the individual choosers and pay attention to the architectural design of choice. Say, think about the organization of a cafeteria or a curriculum or the governance of a university through administrative acts mobilizing money, technology, therapeutic consultations, and discourses of wealth generation, leadership, positive thinking, and brand loyalty. Sound familiar? The cafeteria can be organized in such a manner that choosers are predictably oriented to their desires and preferences, and so on in a kind of paternalistic freedom, as in the case of uh, my son when he was 10 years old, and I said to him, would you please take a bath or go to bed, hoping that he would take the bath at least, maybe go to bed, and he said to me, I'll watch TV. So, he understood choice. Choice is when you actually have a real choice, and of course I had to change my methods of manipulation and incentivizations through ethics, entertainment, information, hedonism, to create a happy harmony back in the household and get him to bed. So, I could decide as an engineer of my cafeteria, according to different goals, that the machinery of choice can be organized as a learning or learned environment. And if you want to study the OECD, OECD literature on learning environments, just Google it and you'll be, have lots of reading with the different purposes, hidden hand of politics, so to speak. 
You can arrange the food to make people better or healthy in a paternalistic welfare sense. Or you can randomize the food choices in a sense of being neutral on your value judgments. People will choose what they want. Or you can arrange the appeal to choices and create spoiled, happy demagogues. Or you can arrange to maximize sales for suppliers who will be family members and pay bribes, what I would call tributary nepotism or even corruption. And five, you can maximize profits and cheapen labor. And I would say the dominant one is the fifth one, but the other ones are around too, if you really look closely. So you have a different dynamic here, and I'm gonna go specifically to what I call three different ways to make money. First one that we always think about in all the literature is on employment and labor, salaries and wages, human capital investment, credentials as a promissory credit for a job future of wages and benefits. Sometimes the job doesn't come. So there's a very interesting notion of credentials are a kind of money. You have to think about credentials as a kind of money. Second kind is, of course, industrial capital, where you invest in the production of commodities of value for social utility in exchange for profit. This is a classical sense of how we think of capitalism, related to one on the one side, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and on the other side, the key content, innovation, which means uh, technology development. And the third one, though, that is the new one, and a return of what we might call the rentier that Keynes thought would not come back, is finance capital. Invest in, manipulate, and invent credits. Money, that is. Stocks, bonds, mortgages, insurances, and a whole host of derivatives. So I'm talking about the derivative market and exchange that has emerged in education. Scene three, indentured students. Student loans are 10% right now of the largest consumer debts outside of mortgages, along with autos, credit cards, and others. The reason the banks went into consumers is because the equity funds in corporations were enough that they start to lend to each other, so investment banks came in, right? So the banks needed a new job, a new market, so they went into doing mortgages, and you know all about the mortgage stuff. So there are all these other aspects. Increasing tuition fees drive students into banks, seeking credentials, certificates, and diplomas. Imagine credentials as a kind of credit money, or commodity money, fiat money, e-money, linked to all the other aspects of money and currency and how it functions. When universities sell the dream, they sell credentials to make money. When they make new credentials, like certificates, they literally make money. They make money. Just like when you get that bill from the credit card and they say we can up your ante on your credit card to $35,000 or something, you say, what do I need that for? That's more equity for them if you say yes. So, Credentials are the derivative market. So, teaching points. How am I doing, Connie? Five minutes. Good, perfect. All right. First one, be charitable with colleagues. It's not personal, but political. And this is really hard. People get pretty nasty when things start to get tight. Uh, or as they say in The Sopranos, right, it's only business. Remember that, it's only business. All right, one, be aware of the preconditions of money, law, language, and technology, and how they articulate and work together to provide choice and property ownership. Ownership it should be separated from conception and execution. There's an increasing division of labor. Two, well, this is my third point, but I started with zero, so if I say it. Aware of the discourses of, or, and affects, the feelings of choice. Understanding why, even if we know it and not to do it, we still do it. That's the desire part, right? Three, don't equate teaching and learning or the end of teaching as merely schooling, credentialing, or the information transfer or aggregations of big data. Do equate it with cognitive, emotional, and bodily development of the thinking, feeling mind. Keep that always in mind. Be wary of mandatory enthusiasm and unrealistic optimism regarding technologies. Learn how to critically judge and act in reality does not make you happy. Being happy is overrated. Okay. Be realistically optimistic, realistically optimistic. And remember that dreaming the big escape is not a solution to the cause of your suffering. Five, authority is a fundamental condition of teaching. Authority is a political concept and a kind of power. Organize to keep it, use it to keep it. Defend truth, I mean it is in our logo, defend it over profit. Six, do not equate consumer choice as personal freedom. It is a definitely not academic freedom. In my work, I would argue, I am less free in the sense of my autonomy in this new learning environment than I was when I first started. Eight, 
Do not reject the new information technologies. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not going, you have to go with it. They're, they're going to be here. But you have to choose selectively as possible with an awareness of the architecture of design and the designs of choice and be a slow adopter because it will change very soon again. And you'll have to learn it all over again. Nine, distinguish owners, designers of choice, and choosers of knowledge production and what it means for making money and increase social inequality, as well as uneven and unequal effects on incomes and wealth, including your own and colleagues. If you've been paying attention, the top 10% now own 70% of the wealth. It used to be only about 45% of the wealth. And Piketty predicts it'll probably be 90% of the wealth, all things given the same by 2050. And Bill Gates agrees with him. He says it's okay analysis, right? He didn't say it was okay, he says we have to figure it out. Be wary of high schoolification of the curriculum. That's what I've called it when I first started to experience it. A hollowing out of credentials, the emergence of what's called, what I would call e-money in exchange in the game for certification. Remember that this is what Aronowitz called the last best job. We retain more control than most laborers and rethink what we mean. Use the spare work collectively for intellectual and artistic labor. You know, I'm talking about this. No, and it just so happens to coincide with my academic labor. But most of what I'm doing now is administration, not academic. Have moral integrity, commitment to the truth. My first practicum teacher said to me when I was in high school, I sat there and he said, Jerry, he said, always have your resignation in the drawer to pull it out when the moment comes that a choice of moral integrity or accommodation faces you from institutional pressures because you'll know the moment you don't use it. You'll know the moment you don't use it. And from my syllabus of the early 2000s, I looked at it and there, this does not appear, it does appear after 2004. Because in my classes I addressed controversial issues at all levels, critical thinking, enlightenment, political action. And I always may offend somebody. So got to get used to that. So how do you deal with it? I have a note in my syllabus that says, of note, students should not confuse the university's commitment to create a welcoming environment of equality and respect with immunity from criticism or as a license to disregard the regulations of the university or to disrespect the academic culture of the classroom. That's when I was facing it quite early. But it's worked out okay after that. Finally, red wine. With friends, and not too much. Thank you. Jerry, that was terrific. Um, in our department, every three years, we would get a new textbook. And we'd say, students had to buy the brand new textbook. Um, and then I remember thinking, well, you know, the difference between a new textbook and the old textbook is like less than 10%. So I very proudly told my class that I was going to break with tradition and you could use the old textbook. I had a student come up to me afterwards and say, thank you very much, Connie. That was all well and good. I can't afford a bus pass to get to school. So um, we have huge problems here. Um, and I think Jerry's given us some really good ideas on some things we can do um, to bridge the gap in terms of finances to think about it, to not disrespect our, our um, administrative people who tell us that we don't, have, we don't have any more photocopying, and then how to try and be a little more judicious in terms of passing it on to the students. We have the opportunity for one question before we go on to our next person. Or one point of discussion. I just wanted to go back to your statement, why, um, and I want to ask, why do you feel less free and autonomy than when, when you first started? And I can understand that, but I just want, to, want you to express it for people. Yeah, I, th I, I think it's just, it's the nature of the changing institution. The first steps were marketization and the breakdown of the boundaries between uh, the corporate world, uh, 
the state and the and the academy. Like uh, Slaughter's work is really good in talking about academic capitalism, right? And the emergence of that. So that dynamic creates a, a, a squeeze, or it in a sense redirects your possibilities of of kind of autonomous action, in the sense that, for the most part, the professional ethics that emerged around. Uh, uh, teaching in universities in the 20th century was based on the f allocation of the state to a particular s space for professionals to act in accordance with a certain notion of uh, ethical freedom, right? And that's what's really being challenged with these new m uh, modes of surveillance and data collection. And, and, uh, it, and so the end point is like, for example, the other day I was trying to look at my Christmas holiday, where I might go, and I was on Expedia looking for stuff. And, uh, and I noticed there was a uh, uh, nice place that kept going on. I was wondering if the price kept going up because I was kept going on it or not because there's a feedback. And, uh, and then I went to Facebook and there was an advertisement from Expedia on my Facebook page, right? Uh, so this is why I would say pay attention to the architecture of choice because I think when we get so busy we're, we pay attention to those daily activities like how do I get my hand out to the students now that I can't use the photocopying and so you adapt your behavior and it's, it's very inter and in fact that I study it and you can look at the whole realms of discourses that have emerged around looking at how to manipulate these mechanisms then you have to look at administrative controls. So some of this then goes back, to which I talked last year about in a different uh, orientation, on uh, the rise of a new kind of administrative power within this. And that plays a very important role in what we say. And that's where, in a sense, the administrative power that you have over your, your office and your classroom space, in a sense, has been taken away a bit. And it's more, it's more uh, evident already in the, let's say, Alberta's K-12 public system. Uh, for example, with the new idea of re the responsibility model of funding and allocation is just what they called in, ed uh, in the public system site-based management. They've already got that. What they're getting now is a collation of data collection of all their knowledge that, that needs to be put on the new infrastructure and the architecture of technology. What we're getting that's new is the new management models, uh, but we've already downloaded a lot of our stuff onto the computers and they're already being used by uh, private corporations and we're hoping there's a whole struggle over intellectual property rights. So those struggles to me are the, come from the, the challenge to my freedom as an academic to act autonomously in that space, right? And I, I think, uh, I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. We'll have time, we'll have time for a more free roaming discussion at the end. Um, now, Tony's going to talk, um, I'm probably giving it away completely, Tony's going to talk a little bit um, about how, when we think about in our classes, we feel free to say whatever we want in our classes. We feel free to do whatever we want in our classes because we're a community. What about with our new technologies as we're moving internationally, as we're moving um, all over the place? So Tony, Tony's going to talk about what stays in, what happens in E-class stays in E-class. And even, even without having international concepts of our digital education, I remember one time years ago, um, I was one of the first, I'm an early adopter, Jerry. Yeah, I, um, I like you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I used discussion groups in a large introductory class. And some student put a rather, even though we had a code of contact, um, put a rather rude joke up. And you know, there were, no absolute, there were no policies at all in the department, in the university, on what you do when someone does something that's disrespectful electronically. Fortunately, now we have lots more of regulations, and sometimes we have too many regulations. And Tony's been studying this for a long time, and I think she can provide us with some really good input on how to stay safe in um, a digital learning environment. Thank you very much. Um, as Connie mentioned at the outset, I did a little behind the scenes work to pull this crew of people together and it's a huge honor for me to work with Jerry, Connie and Melinda. I look up to all of them and um, I'm already learning and we're a third of the way in. So thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to start with this quote, which is fabulous. The future is here, it's just not widely distributed yet by our William Gibson. 
And I did want to say I very strategically organized myself between Jerry and Melinda because I knew Jerry would lay out some of the shifting labor and financial context and I knew that Melinda was going to leave us with some deep concerns around equity and diversity and inclusion and social justice and I wanted to be the bridge between those two deeply meaningful and complex challenges. So I just want to really break it down at an accessible level to what's been on my mind in recent years in teaching. Um, and that is, you know, in the big picture, the importance of a free flow of information in the global academic enterprise, the terrain of information ethics, global citizenship, global citizenship education, contestation around the meaning of global citizenship education, and of course, the ever-challenging expressive freedoms in the 21st century, and we don't have to look past the daily newspaper, radio show, TV, blogging to see explorations of that. Um, and then, of course, technological underpinnings and mandates inherent in distance education today. But underneath all of this, what's on my mind, I'm always thinking about teachers' abilities to teach freely and students' abilities to learn freely. So promptings for uh, today, I think, that can just hang in the air as we move through life and labor after this afternoon. Intercultural dialogue about scholars at risk and relationships between higher education, internationalization, distance education, and precarious labor, which is on the rise, as we all know. So there is a very formal understanding in higher education globally around scholars at risk um, pertaining to particular people. So there's actually a scholars at risk network that exists, and their mission, as we can see here, uh, states around the world today, scholars are attacked because of their words, ideas, and their place in society. Those seeking power and control work to limit access to information and new ideas by targeting scholars, restricting academic freedom, and repressing research, publication, teaching, and learning and that this network is an international network of higher ed institutions dedicated to protecting threatened scholars, preventing attacks on higher ed communities, and promoting academic freedom worldwide. And um, one thing this network does is work with particular institutions who sign on to provide places of sanctuary for scholars who, in, in some instances, as you may know, have to leave their home country in order to pursue education, research, scholarship, and publication. So that's a very formal understanding, a very real understanding, and something that for some of us may be familiar. I don't know the stories of the individuals in the room and may never know, and you may never know mine. Um, but there's also the everyday scholar at risk in the 21st Century Academy, which I would posit at any given moment could be any one of us as teachers, as students. So some key context is, of course, um, thinking about present day context the ubiquity of distance delivery models and certificates, and of course, companion cost recovery. Eroding professoriate, the rise of an increasingly contingent worker model in higher ed and elsewhere, of course. The increase in the number of adjuncts and sessionals in relation to faculty and the deep implications of that when we think about teaching freely and learning freely. Internationalization and then again, a companion fee structure. Tuition sovereignty as we move more towards um, consumer philosophies around tuition. Defining, confining, and redefining academic freedom, which is you know all over the media in Canada today, particularly because of the Buckingham affair at the University of Saskatchewan, and indeed our own president's um, commentary on that, and that continues. Systemic issues with equity and diversity. New behavior and civility codes, and of course that inherent tension between academic freedom, expressive freedoms, and um, law and human rights and social justice. And, and then, of course, um, very interesting, provoking discourse emerging around trigger warnings. Not necessarily new, but certainly gaining attention. So looking into the future, if I think of William Gibson's quote at the beginning about the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. The academy that I envision in the future has a distributed faculty model where we don't necessarily live in the community um, of the university or universities in which we teach, or even the same country. Uh, distance education, satellite campuses, teaching on the go using mobile technologies, not even necessarily having a dedicated corner, cubicle, desktop, workspace, perhaps just smart technology in our pocket. 
um, teaching for multiple institutions, perhaps not having a home institution with a fully developed understanding of our collective agreement and our place in it. And of course, more and more educational technologists, online course designers, uh, people who are often referred to as moderators and facilitators, but not necessarily teachers. People who may be uh, given academic status in their contract and maybe support staff. So the Canadian Association of University Teachers has a very clear, fairly long-standing policy on distance ed. It's quite long. I've just pulled out two elements. One says that um, CODE is dedicated to the removal of barriers that traditionally restrict access to and success in university-level studies and to increasing equality and equity of educational opportunity. Fantastic. It also says university employers may nonetheless misuse distance education techniques to increase managerial control over academic staff and or as an innovative way to save money. Not necessarily so fantastic. So giving you some grounded first-hand personal professional experience, I'll just share that um, about five, six years ago, I developed a graduate course for the U of A, which is still running. Well, I developed the course well over a decade ago for on-campus face-to-face students, but I redeveloped it as an online course about five, six years ago. It's called Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility and Librarianship. The first time I taught it online then was winter 2010, and a student in the class who at the time certainly had a part-time life in Tunisia very early in the online course asked me point blank, is this e-class secure? She was on uh, sure and mostly unwilling to contribute to the discussion forums online because of the nature of the controversial subject matter around intellectual freedom and censorship because she knew she would be moving in and out, hopefully out of Tunisia, both in and out, um, coming back and forth, and she worried about that digital tattoo. And so um, I'd never been asked before, I've been teaching here since 1994, I'd never been asked before by a student, is this discussion for <laughs> secure? in those terms. The answer I gave was no, because I cannot personally guarantee that. Um, so of course self-censorship followed, and I won't go into the details of how I accommodated that student, but that's okay when you maybe have 20 students in one online class that's for on-campus students, and they can wander into your office and safely and privately ask you that question. If it's, it's another thing if that question's coming maybe or maybe not from Tunisia. Um, in winter 2011, my second time teaching it online, a student of the U of A, but who was taking the course from China, where she was working, had very intermittent and limited access at times to required readings, which were all electronic readings, um, due to her geopolitical location in China and the reality of internet filters where she was located. This experience was amplified um, uh, at another level by the temporary block from E-Class due to the internet kill switch in Egypt, which left me feeling very uneasy about having accepted this student's tuition, that students should then feel that she's on a level playing field with her classmates, and yet she couldn't get regular access to the required readings, and at times she couldn't get into E-Class. Um, and so this made me think about how do we build capacity for sanctuary within, and we should never assume we don't have scholars at risk right here. Um, so learning curve in a collective, uh, the, moving to some concrete tips. We can't be naive and we can't be complacent. We do have to consider counter pressures to democratic frameworks, social justice, and the free flow of information. We have to ask questions. We cannot fudge. If somebody asks you if your E-class is secure, you can't fudge when you do not know the answer because there can be consequences to people in real life physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, etc. You might need to seek out folks as I have done well beyond your department and faculty and on into CTL or IST or general faculty council learning environment or U International and, and more. So you can no longer rely on the colleagues on the hallway or a trip to the dean's office. So teaching chips, um, from my own experience, do not guarantee the student's e-class is secure. There is a digital tattoo. 
Um, E-classes are archived on this campus, and um, I actually put, I was trying to delete some of my older E-classes over the summer, actually, because the student comments are still within, and I got a, a message back saying, you, you personally, Tony, can't delete them. You don't have the authority to do that. And then a little, a few months later, and you may have received it as well, I got an email to say that E-classes will now be archived after two years, but they're still there. They don't show up on my screen when I log into eClass, but they're not blown away. So they are still in the U of A ether and beyond with student comments within and with my comments within. And I urge you to consider the implications. Now we need to think ahead about potential repercussions of performing student assessment entirely online, which of course you do if you're in eClass purely. And how can that be used as an archive of intimidation? One of the longest standing now closed, but it was an eight or nine year arc of an academic freedom case at UBC. One of the key professors in that case told me face to face once in Ottawa, Tony, never do assessment on email. It can be used as an archive of intimidation. And my reply was, I'm teaching online. All of my assessment is electronic. So if you just think about that back and forth between an instructor and a student, they're not happy with an assessment or a comment qualitatively about a thought, about an idea. You're urging for more critical density. They don't understand what that means. You say it was a bit reductive. The conversation may go downhill from there. You don't know where that's going to go, and that is all digitally tattooed and archived. And even when it's, we're told it's archived, it is still there. And this, in some instances, could lead to a national case. Um, the student could be right, the professor could be right, they could both be right, they could both be wrong, but it's very different than having a student sit down with you in your office for 20 minutes and talking through a paper. Then in addition to a standard academic integrity statement and a model inclusive language and equity statement, develop a class code around digital citizenship to promote ethical practices, mutual respect and trust in discussion forums, of course develop a copyright statement and operationalize the meaning of participation. Um, I have a class code, I won't go through it with you, but the essence, as Connie picked up on, is our class code is what happens in E-class stays in E-class. This means that you should not take it upon yourself to share, copy, forward, send to colleagues, post outside of E-class. I also say this instruction, of course, comes with the usual and most important caveat that you, you have the right and responsibility to challenge your education, including your teacher. Um, I have a model E-class copyright statement developed by one of my colleagues who's an uh, expert in, in intellectual property, and I can certainly pass that on to you, but it refers to the Canadian Copyright Act. Um, and I provide some operationalization of what participation means, and it extends into cooperative work outside of class, where real, real people are moving and talking and shaking. Um, so what sits underneath? Things I'm really ruminating about. Who and what is a teacher in the age of educational technologists, online course designers, moderators, and facilitators? At the end of the day, in the age of risk management, when something goes wrong, who's the teacher? Who's accountable? Who bears the moral and ethical responsibility that Jerry was referring to? Related implications for academic freedom and for teaching and learning. Because if you're a moderator and you don't have academic freedom, your hands are already tied. A complex and critical balancing act with equity and diversity, which Melinda will uh, lay out for us much more crisply than I can, I'm sure. And um, an engagement in intercultural dialogue about trigger warnings, so you know you are prepared for the question. You may think I don't teach a class that's at all controversial and I don't have to worry about trigger warnings. But, and you may think I don't teach online and I don't have to worry, I'm not, I'm not self-censoring when I'm teaching, but you don't know if you're being recorded on a phone. You don't know when you go off script and go into an anecdote and think you're being funny and the word slips out and you didn't imagine you'd ever say that. Um, what I can say is I think much more legalistically about teaching. I am much more prescriptive in my instructions and my assessment. Is that a good thing? Probably not. Do I feel that I'm a scholar at risk? Yes, I do. So there's my contact information. And just to thank you to Connie, Melinda, Jerry, and Lily Lai from CTL for helping pull this together.
So Tony, you brought up some really important issues. As we, as we move more towards globalization and teaching and learning, how can we be safe? The University of Alberta is committed to um, MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. How can we make sure that we have a good learning experience? And then bringing in Jerry's perspective of credentials as money. How can we make sure that we don't end up with a completely sanitized course that is acceptable to all and safe, but leads to a credential that really isn't worth, worth money? So these are things to think about um, as we get into our discussion. Is there a quick question before we move on to our next presentation or a quick commentary? How many of you are teaching online? And how many of you thought about some of these issues that Tony's brought up? These are really big issues as we start moving out. I mean, our perspective is to, is to become global, globally recognized in teaching and learning, providing certificates throughout the world. And these are gonna become really important issues for us to think about. So by being in one of these very first groups, I think it's terrific that we can start the discussion. And thank you, Tony. Yes. It's just a quick clarification question, but um, a little bit more explanation about what you mean by trigger warnings would be helpful for me. Um, there are some teachers and institutions where, um, for particular courses, there may be a statement on the course outline that content in this course uh, could be traumatic. And um, there are different ways that is handled. In some instances, administrators are allow allowing students then to get accommodation and opt out of certain aspects of the course. And in other instances, there's just a warning, but you can't opt out. And then in instances, there are no trigger, no trigger warnings at all. Um, it's certainly on the rise in the United States. Um, and I would pay attention to see where it may pop up. And again, but just to be clear, there's a real continuum from zero to 100 on how loaded that trigger warning is. Um, and um, it's, it's a very contested area. It's a very difficult area because some things we may anticipate could trigger trauma and other things may seem very benign. And where do you draw the line? And how do you decide if an accommodation should be provided or not? And again, how do you create a level playing field? So I, I, you certainly could just do a quick and dirty Google search and stuff would come up as recently as the last month, probably. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, now, Melinda Smith is from the Department of Political Science. Before she starts her presentation, how many of you have ever been hungry when you've been trying to learn? How good is your learning? It's not so good, is it? I mean, we know from years and years of work with children that we have to provide them with a good breakfast before they go to school. What if our culture tells us we must fast and we have a midterm? What are some of the effects there? What if our culture tells us, our university tells us we must speak up in class for a grade and we don't feel comfortable doing that. What if our, our culture tells us that um, we must have equity on every committee? When I first came to the U of A eons ago, I was one of three women in the department, and I kept wondering why I was on all these committees. At first I was flattered that people would want my great wisdom. I have no wisdom, I have no filter, people don't really like me on committees. Then I discovered it was because we had to have gender equality. And then I really discovered about gender equality when I was pregnant and I was teaching on a floor that only had men's washrooms. I used it, didn't matter to me. I had to go after class. So, Melinda. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> my name is uh, Melinda Smith and I teach uh, international relations, comparative politics and, and gender and politics in the Department of Political Science and also serve for a few more months as um, graduate chair before I go on sabbatical. I want to thank uh, those of the organizers for this important panel, uh, Scholars at Risk, Scratching Old and New Surfaces of Post-Secondary Teaching, and particular Tony Samick, who I um, had some, spent some time with at COUT 
um, and we had an important discussion there on the intersection of equity and human rights and academic freedom, an issue I think uh, Kaut and most faculty associations and universities could do more on. The, I want to, uh, I'll come back to that. I want to, I'd like to acknowledge that this uh, talk is um, taking place on indigenous land. I'd like to acknowledge the original peoples of this territory and the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territories for centuries, the Cree, the Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. So in this presentation, I want to do uh, two or three, three things at least. One is I want to talk about the discourse of risk. Um, it's, it's pervasive and it permeates our thinking, our practices in terms of teaching, research, especially field research, um, and risk management has become a growth industry, uh, both in the university and more broadly. So universities hire, risk, there are risks in universities hiring, tenure, firing, uh, based on perceived risks of, of areas of study. Students say, I'm not going to study that because, well, it's not going to be received well. Uh, teachers say I'm not going to engage in certain kinds of practices because I'm not going to get to good teaching evaluations. All of these are, are in some ways are an assessment of risk and vulnerability and uh, in an era of performance indicators increasing and in audit societies, um, the, in people are uh, obeying cost benefits analysis. But, so that's part of the broader context of this discussion. But my interest is also on equity and diversity, so I want to talk generally about the ways in which, which risks are dis, uh, perceived in society, move quickly to discuss the ways in which one might rethink risk through equity and diversity lens, and then talk about some concrete ways in which risk plays out in the context of equity and diversity. So, um, a basic definition of risk in non-technical uh, context, it refers to, uh, I suppose rather vaguely, uh, in terms of it, uh, the situations in which it is possible but not certain that, and I quote, that some undesirable event will occur. Uh, the word has many meanings, um, but most of it is around limiting or restricting undesirable outcomes. When I first heard the concept Skull at Risk, it was actually through Nobel laureate Derek Walcott, who was visiting the University of Alberta to give a keynote at a conference that I had organized. And he was part of a group that was organizing safe havens or sanctuaries for scholars, artists, writers, poets, who were perceived as risk in their home countries, conflict zones. The assumption then was that we here would provide safe haven sanctuaries. So the risks were abroad, the risks were in conflict zones, the risks were perceived as elsewhere. Not, and, and we, our spaces, were, were perceived as safe havens. Um, so, and, and, and universities often perceive as a safe haven. And I'm going to come to the ways in which the university may not be perceived as a safe haven, if you think of it in terms of equity and diversity. When we see risk used more broadly in the community, we see language like youths at risk, and often it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, two-spirited youths are seen as risk. We see risks in terms of racialized minorities, communities at risk, because they are low income or poor. We see risk in terms of the languages around uh, suicide, and, and particularly around Aboriginal communities, communities at risk. So, and, and often that rich risk is located in the individuals, it's located in their cultures, um, and, and so it's, but it's externalized from us. They are at risk, we have identified the risk, and often that constitution of risk is also seen as a source of opening up space for us to come in and save or rescue or change that situation so then the constitution of risk is also at the same time identifying people who are going to rescue those at risk. Um, so, but, uh, so, so, you see, so you see increasingly now at-risk youth. And the, the media use it, policymakers use it, um, it's used for disabilities, it's used for abused kids, um, 
And in the constitution of risk in this way, it doesn't ask the question at risk from whom or what. And so should the individuals be constituted as risk or should the environment be constituted as risky? Hence my kind of talk, so I'm going to come back to my talk as higher education as risky business since uh, you know, the corporatization within the, corporate, within the context of the corporatization of the university. So specific environments are seen as risky. So but then the problem, of course, is when that happens, we tend to focus on families as sources of risk, again, um, or broken families, um, um, families living in poverty. So not the social, the political economy of poverty and inequality, but the families are in poverty. Single parenting oh, we can't provide a, a, a nuclear family. But there are certain kind of values that are the backdrop of this, this kind of thinking. Third, when you talk about communities at risk, there's also a focus on neighborhoods or schools. Oh, these schools are in low-income income areas. Um, so it's not about the distribution of the but equity or distribution of resources equally to, so why are Aboriginal schools and reserves underfunded relative to school, schools, other schools? So, so the, but the focusing on the Aboriginal youth and, and the outcomes, or they call it achievement gaps, rather than the resource gaps, we shift the blame or the focus or the responsibility to the Aboriginal communities themselves. So, I mean, I think we actually need to rethink, do some serious rethinking of the use of this language of risk and how it locates uh, responsibility, accountability in communities or individuals. Uh, other ways of thinking about this, you see languages around high crime rates, low school graduations. All of this locates the concern within the individuals and achievements uh, uh, and the communities. So when the focus shifts to us, what are the individuals or group at risk, then, then you really see this kind of language uh, uh, um, where it locates it in certain kinds of universities. So what does it mean for us when we think all the data, all the information, all the conceptualization, all the resources persistently and continually and systematically and systemically focus or think about or talk about certain individuals and in certain communities only or primarily in these terms. So our encounters with, with a racialized youth is about their lack. So it's deficit thinking all the way. It's what are they missing, which means then we are the, always think, conceived as the people who are going to fix it or address it or resolve it. Okay. So, and I, and, I th and I think about that in terms of, so when you encounter, say, a high achieving Aboriginal youth or high achieving a minority or talented lesbian, gay, or bisexual youth, if you already have in your head that they're deficit, it's very hard to shift that deficit thinking, the thinking of so to seeing them as creative or innovative or sources of something else. So that, to me, is a risk of a different order that we need to rethink. So I see this as the risk of exclusion and expulsion that I want to talk about then in terms of the, the language of equity, how our attitudes create a source of risk in the academy for, uh, for, this, for diversity, uh, biases and stereotypes that come from this kind of thinking. The way in which we th risk, is a, a second kind of risk is the way we think of credentials of people. So if they're coming from a risky community, their schools are not seen as measuring up, and therefore they don't measure up. So that's a source of potentially exclusion or expulsion of those youth or adults from those neighborhoods, cultural biases. We talked about the ways in which fasting may be part of a culture. But think about exams and holidays around some religions, high holidays. We privilege one religion. So if you're a Muslim or Jewish or have some other holidays, your high holidays or exams can be held on those days, and you will have to conform. What kind of risk does that create for those? students or faculty, um, information barriers, information flows among privileged networks. That's a kind of risk as well. Um, social barriers, inflexible workspaces. We talk about pregnancy, but we could talk about other kinds of inflexibilities. 
mobility barriers, information flows, uh, um, or people who have different kinds of bodies. Um, normative bias of curriculum and research programs. I say to students, this is the discipline of political science when I'm teaching, but we want you to be smart, innovative, creative, bust boundaries, blaze new trails, think outside the box. And then I remind them, you are here to be disciplined. You must know the discipline. There's a paradox in that, isn't it? So when they are trying to bust boundaries, you're pulling them back into being conventional, <laughs> to, 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 to reproducing the discipline. So I see that as a risk to creativity and innovation. I could go on and think about the ways in which everything from a job description, how you write it up, to a hiring committee, are all ways of technologies of power that are risky for, people, for the diversity and for risky for reproducing equity in the academy. So let me end with a quote from Paul Zosky, because um, I know I'm probably over my time already, about risk from desperate thinking. I refuse to identify source of social problems and conditions by looking down rather than up power hierarchies. I reject the notion that people are disenfranchised due to their deficiencies, commit to challenging any suggestion that the way to fix an inequity is to fix the people most disenfranchised by it, rather than to redress the conditions which disenfranchise those individuals. I will not endorse neoliberal or corporate-centric principles by incorporating them, even if implicitly into my multicultural diversity work, I will not minimize educational inequity to, let it, to test scores, refer to people as at risk or families as broken, or discuss multicultural competencies as essential to preparing us to compete in the global marketplace. I will not call something an achievement gap when it's more precisely can be described as an opportunity gap. So I look forward to some questions. Thank you. Before we open it up to every uh, to wide-ranging discussion in terms of finances, digital economies, and risk, um, do we have any specific comments about risk and and equity? I guess you, you, what you've brought up is now made me more confused. <laughs> I, I, no, no, no. I think the, I think the concept of equity is based. I mean, it's based on risk. And then how do, we, how do we make everything inclusive without having have-nots, identifying have-nots, and moving on? So I hope we can get into that discussion. So does anybody have a question or a comment before we start with the full discussion? Actually, it's not really... It's not a question. It's just something that I was thinking about, Melinda, when you were when you were talking about how um, the purpose of, of you know, your, your lectures as a political scientist and you're teaching students in political science, this is, this is the discipline. And although you want them to push boundaries and be creative, but really you're bringing them back, well, this is the discipline. But then I think about interdisciplinarity uh, and interdisciplinary studies and, and bringing the, the various disciplines together. How is that changing? our academic disciplines and what's and I just wonder about that piece and, and I, I don't know if it's even a question but it's just something that I thought of as you were speaking first let, let me respond to Connie's comment because when I first was asked to be a participant on this panel I was thinking of this conversation that Tony and I were involved in where we're talking about competing values right Equity and human rights and academic freedom, fundamental. And it's not either or, but we had to acknowledge that they are, that you had to make a judgment at some point, right? And you had to say, and, 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 and the one issue that came up, so let me give a little bit of context. One issue that was there was 
I was part of the Council Equity and Diversity Council, and we were speaking to the people who, the, the colleagues who were on their Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee about what happens when there are tensions, when these two sets of important values come into conflict. How do you, how do you weigh them out, given the fundamentality of, fundamentality of academic freedom to the academy and to us as academics? And so the example we used were, what happens when academic freedom is used to reinforce the idea, for example, that some minority scholars are unequal because of, this, because of their race or ethnicity, the IQ scores, brain type scores, or that their cultures are barbarian, as the new discourse puts it? What, how can they exercise academic freedom if you already start thinking about them in this particular way? So it, it, it brought us to the, the constitution, the way in which language and the, con the, the, the construction plays into how we think of people, right? And so, it's, so my view is, can we actually talk about equity and diversity in a, in a systematic way unless we actually address these biases? But unless we actually say at some point, academic freedom is important, and here is how it relates to human rights and equity in particular contexts. Now, interdisciplinarity, even interdisciplinarity faces challenges precisely because disciplines <laughs> want to discipline students. And they want to say, you have to know these, these kinds of, you, these bodies of knowledge, these key scholars, these core scholars. And every time we reproduce them, we in some ways limit the opportunity to advance new scholars, new ways of knowing. You see, every time you write a job ad for traditional concepts of the discipline, we limit the opportunities to open up the disciplines the more, and even to, uh, to, to interconnect. There's some of it, you know, like I mean, we had PhD student do a political science and education degree, peace education. But that's more rare than it is, um, it is common. So there are challenges to interdisciplinarity, but me, maybe uh, Tony and um, Jerry have something more to say to that, but I think these tensions are existing and and especially in times of uh, uh, fiscal crisis and austerity. Tony, Jerry. I, I'd like to first see if we can draw in anybody from the audience yeah. and then um, <coughs> perhaps we'll weigh in after that. But um, thank you for raising that, Melinda. And actually, I hope you don't mind if I name you Alan Manson's here, um, who was a colleague of mine. We overlapped on the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee. Were you there that year we met with Melinda? So Alan was there too. So I, I, uh, Alan may want to weigh in, but I don't want to put him on the, I've now named you to anyone watching this in the future that you're here, Alan, because that's what we do. <laughs> well, the only thing I wanted to say, and it results from an investigation that I've been working on, for the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee is, I think there is a dimension to academic freedom uh, that I would call it, when I say that, we're borrowing it from an American scholar, but the ethical obligations of academics who work in an academic community. And how I would define that is, while you have an obligation to to argue, to dispute, to pursue, that can't get to the point of undermining, demeaning, or denigrating the scholarship of colleagues. I, can't, I can say to a colleague, you're wrong because, but I can't say you're an idiot. And what we see, one of the problems of disciplinarity, as you put it, Melinda, it reproduces itself. It also tends to reproduce an orthodox. And if that orthodoxy ceases to, res to, to appreciate the ethical obligations of being a member of an academic community, it can act to exclude the non-orthodox or the heterodox to the great, great disadvantage of everyone within that discipline. So before we even talk about interdisciplinarity, disciplinarity brings its own, its own problems. As moderator, I'm jumping in. <laughs> Sorry, never invite Connie to be a moderator. Um, as, as director of an interdisciplinary unit, I think interdisciplinary is the way we can go. 
In order to be truly disciplinary, interdisciplinary, we must have a shared language. Uh, we must have shared goals or understand each other's goals, and we must have respect. Otherwise, we're never going to get anywhere. We're just having two disciplines that are fighting or three disciplines that are fighting and not getting anywhere. So my answer to you is that we need to consider everything being interdisciplinary, respecting that we have our own perspectives, our own approaches, developing a shared language, um, because that's the only way we're going to move forward in anything. Um, Jerry, I think I'd like you to talk about that. Um, interdisciplinary and shared language because it becomes frightening to the discipline. And everybody, when money is involved, moves back to their individual discipline and holds tight. And it, mm -hmm. how are, like I try and blend what you're saying, <laughs> but how are we going to open up to that? Because once you start blending the interdisciplinary together, sometimes you lose your discipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sure, I um, have a long history working in interdisciplinarity uh, because uh, my first uh, degree, my master's degree, was in. Department of Educational Foundations at the University of Saskatchewan and Department of Foundations came into being mainly through the 1970s to up the quality of the research and education faculty so they could get access to shirk research and the disciplines didn't really want that and so uh, the educators uh, thought it was a good idea and so now we've kind of moved in uh, to most of the faculties of education, the dominant ones anyways have a Department of Foundations. But then the major reforms in the 1990s uh, brought in uh, what now became what I'm in educational policy studies, further diversification within a department because of amalgamation. And since the beginning of the erosion of the social sciences and humanities uh, discipline-based research in education faculties uh, that was led by foundations departments. And uh, so we had to make our accommodations with educational administration, which is a very different way of thinking about the world, and uh, adult education, and also uh, different logics behind these different people working. So I think I have a broad-based experience with that. And my common argument is that when people talk about interdisciplinarity, they always usually talk a kind of a smudgy language about a commonality. And my argument always was, well, you can't have uh, uh, interdisciplinarity without disciplines. Mm -hmm. And you can't escape that issue. This is a non-escapable issue based on knowledges. Also, there are superior knowledges to other. You know, and so in the court, uh, in the court of university truth, uh, there are there have to be superior claims, and we've come through a whole period of the 1990s where there's such cultural relativism that that it was uh, it was the only way to a common heterodoxy. Uh, I think we're into a different period right now, which what I'm experiencing, and that is when the heterodox positions start to gain institutional power um, through good argument, through good rationality. And let's take, for example, indigenous knowledges, which is really central. I think we have one of the leading areas of that. Uh, this is severely challenging, for example, to anyone doing research methodologies in the more traditional vein, right? So as a case in point, I think what happens then is that these, these, these advances of different groups and their different knowledges are, in a sense, now have, are claiming superiority, or at least it's sensed as that by those who are in, in decline of some sort or losing power. And so uh, uh, they go to uh, forms of power that are extra discursive. They start now to use the administrative power of the university uh, through the provost, uh, through the deans, and, and, uh, and that's when it comes very politicized inside. And it gets, I think it's been nasty in different places, and that's why it gets nasty. It's not about the morality. At a certain point in time, morality on these issues will, will carry you so far, but then it becomes a political issue Politics is inherently about power and different ways to mobilize power and to strategically use violence. Because it is violence to deny someone tenure. It is violence to uh, explicate them. It's violence to push them to leave the university earlier than they really want to leave. And so the, we don't usually think about these as, as forms of coercion, as, as, as a kind of violence against people, but they are. And what's, what's really difficult about them, it has to contradict 
the very discourses which we have been raised in in the community. So for me, this is why I've always been a very strong defender of truth. And I, I phrase my discussion as one between truth and profit because I think you need to have be willfully committed to that. Now, that doesn't mean I'm claiming that I have it, but I know it's quite different than in other kinds of institutional ways of organizing things, like making a profit. I know the difference between the truth and making a profit. And, uh, and the whole uh, Gospels of the Bible for Christianity is arranged around Christ going into the temple and whipping the money changers. Well, the reason he was expelling them, but he was expelling them with the use of violence. So there's a sense where the heterodox groups are now compelled to, in a sense, pull onto those resources of control and power and use them. So it's no longer about discourse. So that can be claimed that they are now being dictatorial. They are trying to impose their criticality on other people. They are the ones who should remain in their place. And I think this is a, it's going to be a really difficult struggle. And I just say, watch The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, the book, watch the movie, and you'll get some sense of, of, of the kind of the phase I think we're in and how significant the changes and the debates that we're having. And they're not new. They go back thousands of years and institutional dynamics of state organized or empire organized forms of knowledge versus challenges that come up. And, uh, and it's not inherently natural in the sense that it just happens and you need to adapt. You actually participate by the actions that you take. And you can choose to do something or you can choose to do something else. Responses? Further comments? From our panel, a response? I guess I want to follow up on part, I mean, I'm thinking of different conceptions of risk. One of them is risk, as you have to take risk in order to be creative, to be innovative, to be transformative. Connie, I think that's what you're alluding to when you, uh, in part about my, my comments. The other hand is, I think we are in the midst of a great social transformation. I've said this elsewhere before, which is to say, we are, the society in which we live is changing. I mean, for example, we're in Edmonton and we're in Alberta, so we, where you have one of the largest indigenous, urban indigenous groups. We have uh, Canada trans, and, and US transforming from societies which are majority of European origins to which I think in 20, 30 years, there will be increasingly societies made up of majorities of what you call in Canada racialized minorities. In these kinds of contexts of great tra social transformation, demographic transformation, it creates uncertainty, it creates vulnerability, it creates fear and anxiety. And so I see opportunity for the university. This is something we should be teaching about, something we should be learning about, this should be something we should be seizing. However, you also have people feeling destabilized by this. And when you destabilize, it leads to certain kinds of violence. And, it, and, and the desire to expel, to resist, to hold back transformation. And so this is the, un, this is the I see this as the unstable environment, social environment in which we are in, where people are resisting new forms of knowledge, uh, but and some, are, see, some are embracing it. Others are saying, oh, we will deal with that when the financial situation is better. Um, so, it, so it's not, it's not probably conducive to, the, so it's not, um, I won't say efficacious, this is the word I want to think, but it's not efficacious that we are, all these changes are happening in times of austerity. I, and I, uh, so I, you know, I think, and this, I see the same issue for things around diversity, diversity with equity. Um, despite all this, what I call this great social transformation outside the institution, there are parts of the institution that, that's retrenching, that does not, that's resisting this change. And I think it's actually going to undermine those disciplines, um, undermine their relevance, undermine people migrating to them. Um, because they don't offer, they don't have anything to offer except the past. And so if you are a scholar educated in 
this area and you were getting your tenure and you're now seeing yourself coming into being and, and finally getting some say and then here you are, you have all these people at the gates <laughs> saying move over, it's, it's destabilizing. So, I mean, we are, in, we are institutions of higher learning and you would think we would be at the forefront of trying to make sense of these changes. Um, not just trying to manage diversity to hold the barbarians at the gate, but actually trying to find more innovative and creative ways of embracing change and also trying to, um, to handle this. So, I, I mean, when I, I think this, the, the value of this panel is that maybe you can help to spur some of these kinds of conversations and, I mean, and, and to help, help us think about the ways in which the institution, uh, Center for Teaching and Learning, our respective departments and, 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 and organizations can have more of these conversations to say, okay, these can be risk as things to be, we can be risk averse, these are things that we can see as risk to manage, or these are things that we can see as risk as a way of, of creating opportunities uh, going forward. Um, and so that we don't end up with the kind of violence or that uh, Jerry uh, rightly points out too, although, I mean, we can say violence is also a source of change. I mean, so, so the paradoxes are there, and there's no getting away around it. If I may jump in, um, I think we all have a lot to think about as we leave her. I'm, I'm thinking so much I can hardly speak, but um, I came in with the baseline, and Jerry alluded to it at the beginning of his contribution, that the working conditions of teachers are the learning conditions of students. So each piece of the panel and, and Connie's very skillful moderation and sort of attention to what's really said by each speaker, thank you, Connie, um, brings us back to that. And as we continue to have panels sharing teaching tips, we need to be mindful of the working conditions influence the learning conditions. And so whether it's a shifting labor context um, that is beginning to disadvantage people who are happy with the status quo when they could photocopy as much as they wanted, or, or whether it's people who are finally um, getting to get to the door and then the, you know, the code on the door is changing. Um, it's hard to give teaching tips without actually, that's why I use the phrase personal professional case experience in my case, because it's really hard to give teaching tips without exposing something personal about yourself and your context as a teacher. Um, and there was something else I wanted to say, but I forgot what it is, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> More comments, input. We're at a wonderful point, right? We've learned about thermodynamics, homeostasis, change. Being at a steady state, being in, steady, uh, in homeostasis is good for a short period. But we all know that we're all going to eventually decompose into greater chaos. And it's only through great chaos that we get great developments. Children learn only when they're confused. Um, society changes only when there's disorganization. So we need to be disruptive. We need to be thinking about these things. We shouldn't be griping too much about not being able to photocopy. We should use this as an opportunity for thinking about how we can change the way we are teachers and how we are learners and develop an even greater academic community where everybody can feel safe, everybody can take risk, where there is equity, where maybe our credentials do lead to financial gain or for somebody, even if it's just the university. But hopefully we can all think about these things as we move forward throughout our daily lives and our longer lasting academic careers. So I wanna thank our wonderful panel for bringing up their ideas. Um, I also wanna thank CTL for making this possible and Lily for all the work that she does to make sure that this stays possible. And especially I wanna thank you guys for coming and starting to think about these issues. It takes risk. <laughs> to come think about being a scholar at risk, to, adm to admit that maybe you're one of these scholars at risk, or that we're all at risk, and that we can all grow from this. So thank you very much to everyone for being in attendance.